Good afternoon and, and welcome everyone. Thanks, Vanya. It's, it's nice to see folks here. Um, we have been farming at Bluegate Farms since 2005 and we are a chemical free farm, um, which makes uh, some things a lot easier and some things a lot harder. Um, we were very lucky. We farm on family land and we're very lucky that um, our family has a long history of uh, encouraging a lot of ecological diversity on the land that we moved on to. So um, we that we were lucky with that, but it also raises uh, a certain number of challenges. But the, the thing that it set us up for really well was having great um, micro systems all the way around the farm. So we have native prairie, we've got some native timber, um, and we have a lot of plantings around the farm that set us up well, let us uh, move forward without having to start from scratch. So we were we were very lucky there. Um, Rob was not so lucky uh, with their starting situation. So I'll I'll let him introduce that system. Yeah, uh, I'm Rob Fox with the Genuine Fox Farm. We're located near Tripola, Iowa, which is northeast Iowa. And unlike Jill's farm, we actually uh, purchased an acreage that's 15 acres in size. And it's surrounded by corn and soybean fields. Uh, there really isn't uh, anything that's much closer than about a mile away that is is a different kind of habitat. And in fact, most of the land we ended up growing uh, vegetables and fruit crops on and as pastures, most of that land was being uh, used for corn and soybeans before we took possession of the land. Uh, so in contrast to Jill, we had to start building uh, pollinator support areas, and we had to start building some wild spaces that supported uh, habitat for some of the uh, things that we wanted to have happen on our farm. And the transition for us was, uh, shall we say, Jill, would you say maybe uh, trying would be a good word for that kind of transition? I think trying is an excellent term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, one of those things where you don't have Pretty much you don't have anything to start with, which means we didn't start with a whole lot of uh, uh, natural predator services on our farm. It was mostly all pest services, if you will call them that. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of where, where our farm was. Uh, but we, we started in 2004, so right about the same time Jill did. Uh, both of our farms followed some similar paths to getting to a point where uh, we were successful enough that we could keep going. I mean, the fact that we're still talking to you today tells you that that no matter what we might say privately to each other about struggles and, and whatever else, we actually have done pretty well uh, as far as our farms are concerned. Uh, our farm at one point in time had a 120 member CSA, and now we have scaled back a little bit and we're doing more with a, a email list and uh, do donating to the food bank. Jill, what's the size of your CSA approximately? We run about a 60 member CSA, so about half of the size that that Genuine Fox used to have. Um, and we also do a lot of direct to consumer through online ordering. Um, and and I I should have said that said that in the beginning. So we are um, a horticulture farm. We're we're primarily produce and uh, and flowers now. So we're we're not looking at uh, trying to deal with these situations with the large scale field crops. Right. And in both of our cases, we've had poultry. Uh, we still have poultry and Jill has uh, moved away from having poultry, which makes her very happy. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. But you do have you do have the alpacas on the farm. Mm -hmm. We do. So may, we might as well get on with the, the fun topic at hand. Uh, so we're talking about different uh, allies and adversaries that we have to deal with on our farms because we are attempting to work uh, with wild spaces and pollinator habitat on our farms. And thought we'd start by talking about how we've been encouraging some of these uh, different critters to be on our farms, both good and the bad and some of the neutrals. And one of the things that we do a lot on our farm, and this is how we started building up our services more rapidly on our farm since we started with nothing, is we worked very hard at intercropping. So a lot of annual plantings, uh, that was one of our core 
core beliefs is we're going to do a lot with annual plantings. We're going to mix things up a lot. We're going to try not to have anything that comes even close to a monoculture if we can. Uh, so you see an example of one of our fields. Uh, this was actually just prior to a PFI field day, I think. Um, I don't know, 2016, 2017. And in this field, you can see all kinds of things. you got zinnias on the right. You've got some melons in the middle. You've got some basil in there. We've got borage on the left. And what you don't see in the middle is there are often uh, flowers that we use as markers in the rows as well. So if we change varieties, we usually put a marker inside of that row with by using a flower. Uh, and that's just kind of an example of, of how complex our systems can get on this farm, in particular with the annual plantings. Um, but we we pretty much sold out for this at the beginning, but we we even ramped it up further in 2015. Uh, we did a quick experiment where we said, all right, this year we're going to plant one third fewer melons in our melon field, and we'll replace that with more flowers, more pollinator mm -hmm. services. And we were kind of expecting, well, if we get one third fewer melons, I guess we'll deal with that, but we'll be happy because we'll see flowers, you know, and maybe we'll see more pollinators. Um, but that year we actually got one third higher melon production simply because we did enhance the habitat for the pollinators. Uh, and we replicated that same thing uh, year after year. So we pretty much sold ourselves on, give yourself some space to make sure you're attracting the pollinators to where you want them to be. And they typically provide the work services you're wanting. Uh, so yeah, diverse planning plans. That's that's one of our biggest things. And I think that probably cut our transition uh, probably by a year or two. And it actually made being a certified organic farm possible for us, I think. Um, one of the things that... Uh keeps us entertained on the farm is the number of various wildlife Denzians we run into all the time when we're out there. Um, you can see one of my crew members here is sitting on a grass pathway. We're in kind of an unusual situation where about half of our production space is in permanent bed systems. So we have permanent grass pathways between all of our beds um, because we're on a slope. So we do a lot of, of things to control erosion, but what that also does is give us refuge space. So while we don't have blooming plants in between each of our beds, we do have um, perennial and, and consistent cover, which gives us a lot of um, microbial refuge, which, which Robin, I really didn't have on our list, but, but it's a really important part of our system. Um, and that allows, uh, space for both our soil microbial um, partners, as well as some of our other wildlife um, outside of our beds, but within our production space. And because we have that access to that land, we're not, we're not really crunched for land. We're in a, we're in a very lucky position there. Um, we have the opportunity to have a lot of the blooming plants, especially the native blooming plant, outside the borders of our growing space. So we don't have to really give up. Um, we're not giving away required production space to try and balance this. Um, but one of the things Rob said that, that I related to what Rob said that I found really interesting years ago was that someone mentioned to me, um, and I'm sure that there are are uh, scientists out there that can uh, give you the finer details on it, but on large blooming fruiting plants, things like squashes and melons, things with large blooms, it can take at least six visits by a pollinator to successfully pollinate for that one squash or that one melon. So if you don't have a huge range of pollinators, the likelihood that all of your blooms are going to get hit six times is pretty thin. And it's important to have that diversity of those pollinators because different pollinators only come out in certain conditions. We keep bees on our farm, so we're not all uh, dependent on the native pollinators, but 
honeybees won't come out, won't pollinate if the wind speed is above, I want to say, 22 miles an hour. So if you're in a in a time where you're needing things pollinated and we're in a windy period, you can't depend on something like a honeybee to take care of that. You need the bigger bumblebees, the moths, the birds, some of those larger pollinators to help you out. So being able to have those diverse, highly diversified pollinator spaces around your production space is really important. Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, on our farm, we used to have uh, fields that were about 60 foot wide by 200 foot long. And in between those, we had a tractor width grass clover path. Uh, I'm wondering if you could describe how, when you have these grass strips about how big everything is, how big are your beds? Sure. So um, on average, our beds run uh, in our permanent beds, they run anywhere from 80 to 130 feet long, but they're only three feet wide with a two foot wide grass pathway between them. So basically enough for us to walk with a harvest, uh, a wheelbarrow or a harvest wagon between those beds. So it's it's not a lot of space within the within the production space itself. That brings us to insectary strips. I think you get to start on this one, Jill. Yeah. Um, so sometimes the things that we're planting, um, we're planting for a variety of reasons. The uh, the photo, at least it's on my left, with the bumblebee, um, that's bolted arugula that that bumblebee is in. So sometimes we're planting a crop with the intention of it being an insectary blend. Sometimes we simply let a crop, if we have the space, actually bolt, go to bloom. Some of them will let even get so far as to go to seed because that also supports that diverse ecosystem, provides food plants for a lot of those animals that we depend on, but it's not a cash outlay. So we're not having to buy seed. We're not having to prep extra ground. We can take advantage of those naturally well we'd rather have the arugula to harvest once we lose it if we can leave it in place we try and do that um but this year for the first time we're we're really doubling down on our insectary strips and we're putting in um a, a section that we're taking out of production this year that's over 2,000 square feet um so we're we invested in a specialty insectary blend for this area from prairie moon and uh, and we're going to put that in permanent uh, insectary bed just to continue to to support that land and support our crops and see if we can can uh, up our game a little bit on that. And I know Rob, I know you guys have have done some work on that as well. Yeah, uh, actually, there was a PFI trial where we did insectary strips where they came up with a mix. I think Xerxes helped come up with this mix. It has some buckwheat in there and some cosmos and and just a, a whole bunch of other things. You, that's the picture on the right of your screen. Uh, and that's actually one of the better patches. Uh, unfortunately, the amount of buckwheat, I think, was a little high and it kind of suppressed a lot of the other things. Uh, but we also like to uh, let certain crops just go and flower. And I find a lot of the cold the cold season crops, you know, once it gets too warm for them and they start bolting, a lot of those are really friendly for pollinators. And if you don't need the space, then leave them. They're, they're not going to hurt anything. I've also found that I don't mind letting broccoli. You know, once broccoli is done, if you can't keep up or you don't want to keep up with side shoots, go ahead and let those go to flower. Uh, mustards, mustards are really good flowering too. They, they tend to attract a lot of, a lot of insects. Uh, one of the things we do on our farm is we're really cognizant of a long bloom season on our farm. We, uh, if if you have your own honeybees, of course you should be thinking about a long bloom season for them. But we also realize we need to get those native pollinators to be doing their thing on our farm, and we want them to want to be on our farm. Uh, so we've done a number of things that uh, we hope make it a good long bloom season for them. So things like uh, bluebells and pasque flowers, those are on your right. Those are two very early season and, and can be native type flowers that we can have. 
and we've tried to encourage both of those. Uh, we've we found that the pask flowers often like the more cultivated areas if we want them to be consistent, and the bluebells more shaded areas. But in both cases, they they can do a pretty good job in Iowa. I think here and down in in South South Iowa, I think it works pretty well for both of those. Um, the other thing that we like for the tail end of the season is we've tried to encourage asters. Um, asters are really good pollinator friendly. You'll see them covered with all kinds of different bees and other critters. Um, the, the New England asters, the purple that you see in the, the picture down on the bottom left, those are often a little bit more cultivated, but they're not too hard to encourage to reseed and pop up elsewhere. And then the white ones are the thousand flower asters. People have other names for them too. Uh, you don't have to do much to encourage those. You just have to let some of them pop up and then they will pop up everywhere. Uh, and I've kind of gotten to the point where I don't mind seeing patches of them. Uh, th there might be times, we talk about allies and adversaries. There might be times that these thousand flower asters are a bit of an adversary. Uh, but if it's an area I don't intend to be using and they're doing their thing there and the pollinators are in it, I just kind of shrug my shoulders and say, have at it. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't have to be perfect for me, uh, but it's perfect for the pollinators. Oh, we got all kinds of things in this picture. Um, so, Jill, I'm going to just start with, with one in particular. Actually, I'll, I'll talk about two of them. On the bottom left is a thread-waisted wasp, which looks meaner than it is. You could probably hold one of these in your hands. It won't sting you unless you try to squish it. Uh, and a lot of people look at it and think it's mean and, and, and run away from it. And it's really not, not terrible. Uh, well, a lot of wasps are good pollinators, believe it or not, because they like to hang out uh, on things like the goldenrod you see here. And they will, they will do a little bit of eating of the nectar, but they're also hunting for some of the critters that come there to, to, to eat themselves. And uh, they do actually predate on some of the things that cause us problems in our gardens. So I don't mind seeing these guys uh, running around here. And then the other one I like to talk about are the ladybugs. You know, we've got a ladybug on the right-hand side. Um, whenever we have aphid problems, it's really tempting to start getting upset about the aphids. But usually on our farm now, you give it about 20 hours and then the, the ladybugs show up after you get a little bit of an, of an aphid outbreak. Uh, so it's been nice to see the population on our farm ladybugs. We didn't have much when we moved here. And over the past 20 years, the populations have improved dramatically. And I think that's been a great thing. Um, so I'll talk just super briefly um, on the top of the screen. You see one of our honeybees. Um, we, we do keep, I believe right now we have maybe seven hives. Um, so we're no longer at a, at a big production size anymore. But having those honeybees around is a, is a great thing. It, helps remind us to be attentive to um, some of our uh, pollinator spaces at different times of the year, I think. Um, and that honeybee is in a uh, peach blossom. We have quite a few, about 100 fruit trees on the farm. Um, so the, the bee pollinators are very important for us, as are the moth pollinators, which we see later in the evenings when, when the blooms are on. And if you've never seen what I would call a flock of moths pollinating a blooming fruit tree at, at sunset. It's, it's pretty remarkable. And it's great to see those big numbers um, since you don't often see huge swarms of an individual pollinator. Um, that's a great thing to see. Uh, the picture of the web is one of our golden orb weavers and we have a very high population of them on the farm. Um, and if we find them in places where they have to be moved, because they will sometimes set up in the middle of a, of a crop that we're harvesting, we relocate them to our high tunnels because they are excellent trappers in the high tunnels for all of the pests that annoy us in there. Um, so we often have both an indoor and an outdoor population of those. Um, and we're a 100% no kill on the spiders and most of the other insects on the farm. Um, when new employees come in, we, we talk a lot about the, uh, the natural uh, insects, plants, and animals that, that 
we don't consider pests, even if they're annoying at the time, because they are so important to us. There's a little bit of controversy because now we do have some introduced species of some of our native pollinators. Um, the, the Asian lady beetles that were brought in to support the soybean crops and now the Chinese mantis, um, which I'm pretty sure that's a Chinese mantis, uh, praying mantis in that picture, given its size. Um, you know, I, I'm not smart enough to always differentiate between what the introduced species and the native species are. As far as I'm concerned on my farm, uh, anyone who's here is welcome to be here. Um, we don't bring in introduced species intentionally because you can purchase um, a lot of predatory insects and we're very careful to make sure that if we do that, that they're the native species coming in and not the introduced species. Rob, have you guys ever brought in brought in beneficial? We have not brought in beneficials uh, for the same reason. A lot of the mm -hmm. a lot of the available beneficials you could purchase would be uh, a non-native, and so we chose not to do that. Uh, but it's a good question because because we started without having some habitat on our farm, the thing that's slowest to come to our farm are some of the larger predatory uh, spiders and insects. So we don't have many orb weavers on our farm, even today. I mean, we've been doing this for 20 years and we celebrate when we see one of these um, because we want them here. But hey, predatory pop populations have fewer generations each year. It takes longer to establish them and it doesn't take as much to destroy them. Uh, so yeah, we, we're happy when we see them. And yeah, I should have noticed that was an Asian lady beetle down there. I should have talked evil about it. Bad Asian lady, lady beetle, but still. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the insects that we're trying to encourage and what we're doing to try and encourage them. But, you know, the question is why? What, what's the big deal besides pollinators? What are these populations doing for us? And, and this is one of the answers. Um, tomato hornworms are a often a significant issue for us. Um, but because we have uh, diversified plantings, the best control for them, besides your crew hand picking them off with lots of screaming, um, is to have the, the insects that are parasitizing them. So this is a parasitized tomato hornworm. Um, it's a tiny parasitic wasp that, that, and these are all the eggs that have been laid on this, on this hornworm. And this past year, my crew often likes to keep track of how many hornworms they've pulled off, but they know that the, if it's covered with what looks like rice, you leave it in place because we want all of those little baby wasps to hatch and populate the rest of the area. So this year, I want to say 75% of the hornworms that we found on tomato plants in the field were parasitized which for me is a celebratory point. That's a great thing um, because then we don't have to worry so much. We're, it shows that we're, we have enough uh, native feeding ground for those wasps. Um, so the Umbrelliaceae family, like the uh, Queen Anne's lace and, and plants in that family are major attractors for this parasite or for this parasitic wasp. So. The fact that we're seeing such a high population lets us know that we're doing good things to keep that supported. Yeah, I get to talk about another one that a lot of people have fun with, or two actually, the squash bugs and the and the cucumber beetles. And uh, on our farm, we I've just shown you another picture of one of our strategies, and one of our strategies is to flood it with diversity. Uh, if you flood your growing with various uh, cucurbits with diversity, at least on our farm, that seems to do a couple of things. Uh, one of which is, of course, it reduces the attractiveness to the pest because you have not just their food sitting there. It's not like you have a flashing eat at Joe's sign saying, hey, everybody who is a cucumber beetle come here and eat this because it's not, not all interesting to them. Uh, but the other thing is that you look at that, that's, that ground is covered with green and flowers and whatever, 
So yes, it'll attract pollinators, but it also will provide cover for frogs and snakes and toads and all these other great creatures that will eat some of those insects and keep that, that population lower. Uh, if you want some ground beetles, then this is a good way to have it because over on the right and on the left, we'll have some permanent grass paths, uh, one of which we're, uh, we allowed to grow out a little bit and we disturb it as little as we can. Uh, so essentially what we've done is we've, we've made it a, sure, there could be some uh, cucumber beetles and squash bugs in there, but we've also served them up on a platter to the things that like to eat them. And in the end, it tends to balance out for us. Uh, after the first five years on our farm, we have not had much trouble with either of these. And even during years when other folks in Iowa are telling us that the pressure from both of these uh, particular insects is extremely high for them. We might see a slight uptick, but we don't have a real problem with losing crops. And that's a big change because when we first started, we would have to plant about five times the number of plants we thought we needed to get as much as we could get for our CSA uh, in order to handle the pressure from both of these. And now over time with the more balanced system, we've got enough balance for these particular pests that we don't have to worry about them terribly much. Does that mean that someday the you know things on our farm will go bad and we couldn't have a big spike? Uh, yeah, that could happen. Of course it could, but I think we've made it very unlikely uh, as compared to other systems. So I think that's a, a real win for this particular kind of planting method. I, I will uh, hop in and say um, we are, probably about as diversified as Rob is, in addition to having these great wild spaces around. Um, and cucumber beetles and squash bugs are still a significant problem for us. So this isn't, being diversified does not eliminate that issue. Um, they are probably the largest two pests as far as economic um, hits on our farm. And we just plant as many of those crops as we can and slam those, uh, things out to our customers and our members as fast as we can because they're gonna die. Those those plants are gonna die. And for us, we overplant and and that's our, our defense mechanism. Yeah, the other defense mechanism I suspect you use too is you go with shorter season uh, of the varieties. So mm -hmm. the delicata squash, for example, or, or anything in cucurbit pipo would be shorter season. So you could run that. If you do a long season pumpkin or whatever, you're going to have a little more trouble. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, this year for the first time, we're cutting out all of our long season winter squash because it was uh, we were getting zero return for them. So sometimes you make those choices by cutting the crops that are causing you the biggest issues. And it's kind of nice to to have this where it's it's working one place and not working another because we can start asking questions about well, what is it about the habitat in each location? that makes it harder to deal with than the other. Uh, if we had answers to that, then Jill and I would immediately tell you. And of course, Jill would then be growing the long season squashes successfully because we'd right. have an answer. But this is just this is just how nature works sometimes. We, we can't figure it all out. Uh, another one that we can talk about are the cabbage butterfly larva and the cabbage loopers, you know, that uh, make people unhappy when they have extra protein in their broccoli. Uh, if they take a bite and find half a worm, they're usually not terribly happy about that. Um, but what we found on our farm with those is once again, trying to break up the crop. And we found that alliums, anything in the allium family, it either repels or it masks the presence uh, of broccoli, cauliflower, anything in that family. Uh, so we have found, while it's not like perfect, it's not like there will be none, it's a very tolerable level that you can easily get rid of if you soak the crop in cold water when you harvest it, which you're going to do anyway to clean it and take field heat out. So uh, we've been able to find that that this has been a, a fairly easy solution. And if you'll notice the spacing, they're not terribly close together. Uh, we want the onions far enough away that we can do the cultivation we need to do. And we want them far enough away so that if you get a wind, the broccoli doesn't roll over on top of it and cut the sun out. You know, the, the onions need all their sun. Uh, what kind of things do you do with these particular pests, Jill? Um, it's a lot of the same. So we we don't grow all of them in one area. They're, they're in diversified locations and we interplant very much like this. 
in fact, this could be a picture of our farm. Um, so that that works for us as well, as well as separating that risk, diversifying that risk out a little bit. Um, so we do that. We also have, have been really pleased to see that not just um, what we think of as the parasitic wasps, but the, the larger, there's a class for them and I can't remember what it is, the larger wasps that most people don't like, um, because we have great feeding around the perimeter of our fields, we have a really high wasp population and it's been increasing notably on the farm. And those wasps are also, um, they're omnivorous. So they're meat eaters as well as taking um, not some pollen, but, but more nectar from plants. So we see the, th thank you for switching that. We see, you can see on the right there that the wasp that's there, it's holding, um, you can just kind of see in that picture, it's holding a uh, cabbage moth caterpillar in its, in its legs and eating it, which is absolutely delightful on my, on my part. Um, so seeing some of that happening lets us know that our, our diversity is helping. Yeah, I've, I've noticed the same thing. Our wasp populations have been getting higher and higher the longer we've been on the farm and doing the things we're doing. Uh, and it does take a little bit to get used to the idea that these are not things that you always get rid of. I mean, I grew up with Pete, you know, with my dad always saying, no, you got to get the, the wasp killer because we've got another nest on the eve of the house. Mm -hmm. It was you go get it because they're dangerous and scary. And I've had to over time just say, well, okay, there's a wasp. Okay. It's in a place we don't want it to be. <laughs> uh, so sometimes you do have to remove them. Speaking of allies and adversaries, they're not always going to do what we want them to do. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I welcome the wasp populations. They have really helped us a great deal. But sometimes it doesn't work that way. Uh, sometimes we can't find a solution. I mean, we've we've got the tent worms up there. And that's, as Jill said earlier, she said, well, we just, we take them down and burn them. Because uh, that's what you do. And sometimes you just have to work around losses, like planting extra or expecting during certain seasons you'll have a peak of a certain pest and you got to deal with it because that's just the way it is um, but overall i think we can probably say that that doesn't happen as often as it might have if we didn't do all the things that we do mm -hmm. so here's a reminder <laughs> not every organism has to be entirely on your side to be something that's good on your farm I, I like to point to the uh, the snake on the window. That's actually inside my office. That is not entirely where we wanted the snake to be, but apparently there was good eating in the house and it was a nice sunny day. So it's time to sun themselves. Uh, what else do you, what other kinds of things do you want to talk about on this topic, Jill? Well, I look at my notes. Uh, well, I, I see we're getting uh, short on time. So um, unless someone has a specific something about this slide, uh, I think we should probably roll forward. Let's do that. So we're going to talk about four-legged critters now. And just very briefly, if you look at that wide crack on that old foundation, you'll see a fox kit. So the Genuine Fox Farm has had fox kits on the farm. Um, and just wanted to point out that they would be pretty darn good at taking care of a bunch of rodents. You just can't get them to sign a contract not to eat your chickens. That's one of the problems we've had. So we don't have much issue with fox on our farm, um, but we have a terrible time with deer. So one, you know, I I sing the lauds of that we're in such a fabulous location that we're surrounded by so much great diversity, but that brings lots of challenges too. And Deer have been um, probably the largest single economic negative factor uh, as far as uh, adversaries and allies um, on our farm. And we have done a lot of different things to deter them. Um, we do have uh, hunting that happens on our land during appropriate hunting seasons. But the thing that's been the most successful for us is what's called 3D deer fence. And that's what's up in the picture in kind of different formations. That top picture with the birdhouse on it, that is the technical way that you set up what's called this 3D deer fence. And it's two consecutive runs of high visibility electric tape. We mostly use the electrical tape. 
Um, there's an outside run that's a single strand at 24 inches high. And then there's an interior one run of two strands. The first is at 12 inches and the second is at 36 inches. So this goes all the way around um, all of our original production fields. And the reason that it works most of the time is that deer don't have the same depth perception that humans do. So when they come up to that, 36 inches is nothing for a deer to jump over. But when they come up to it, they don't understand the, stag the three staggered lines and the fact that they move in the slightest breeze. So the deer, their brains don't process what they're seeing. So rather than just hopping over it, they come up to it and they smell it. And we hopefully shock the daylights out of those soft little noses and, and they turn around and go the other way. Um, we have been using this fencing system now, I believe for 18 years. And it has taken most of that time for the deer to learn. So, you know, the deer teach their young. So what we had to do was break, break their habits and teach them that this is not a desirable place to go. We've been successful enough with that, with this energized, with the electric version of it, that we're now expanding that use into areas where we're trying to break their pathways. So the other two photos show the land on our hedgerow that surrounds our biggest production field. And we were having serious deer issues in this area. And it's a much larger space to try and fence in. So what we did was we took our high visibility tape and we just mimicked what the original fence was. And this fence is nothing to keep them in physically, but they see it as a barrier and it breaks their habits. So in that bottom photo, you can just see where the middle fence post is coming down. You can kind of see a mark in the ground. That was their pathway. They were hopping that fence and walking there, but that's no longer a pathway for them and hasn't been for about a year and a half because they see this tape and they, they don't broach it anymore. So this has been highly successful for us. That said, if there's something chasing those deer, they're gonna go right through that fence, but they don't hop it casually and they generally don't hop it to graze anymore. Um, and <laughs> the place that we never thought we would need deer protection is in our high tunnels, which is just ridiculous. Um, so we now use the one inch square poly deer fence. It looks like really heavy duty bird netting on the sides of our high tunnels, on the roll up sides, um, because we found that even with the sides down as low as two feet, the deer would get down on their little knees and crawl in. Um, and we, we lost a lot of crops and also had some high tunnel damage when a fawn and its mother got separated in our high tunnel um, and just about ripped out our back wall. So we, we now keep this mesh in place. At one time we were using screening and it increased the heat in our high tunnels too much. So uh, the, the deer netting um, was a good solution for us in there as well. And Rob, I know you've had trouble with deer in your tunnels too. We did starting last year. So the nice thing is we noticed it. We knew that you had done this. So we actually just put up Hort Nova fencing mm -hmm. along the side of the, of the wall. And that actually stopped them because they hadn't established a super strong habit of going there. Uh, and then we also made our presence known more often during the times when we knew they were walking through. So that that kind of helped a little bit. Does that mean that it won't be a problem this year? No, it's possible they'll find a way around this, in which case we will adjust. And that's just how that goes. Uh, another thing that we deal with on our farm are multiple things, you know, rabbits, raccoons and Chucky McWoodchuck. Uh, the woodchuck, if it can get into your trays of started plants, can certainly eat many trays in a hurry. Uh, we had an entire succession, well, multiple su successions of about a thousand plants get destroyed by one woodchuck because they got into where we had all of our trays of plants. They were sitting there ready for transplant the next day and uh, we didn't protect them. So one of the things that we do to try and protect from most of these critters is we have poultry netting, both the, the smaller couple foot tall and then the taller four foot tall poultry netting. And essentially we're attempting to exclude them. Uh, so you see there's a little solar charger down there. I think I probably took the uh, poultry netting down so I could mow where it's going to be 
and put it back up. But what you see mostly in this this area is nothing that most of our uh, critters are going to really harm now. The cucumbers are big enough, peas are big enough. Uh, but there's another little trick in this picture. You notice we've got peas next to the cucumbers and there's two rows of peas with different kinds of trellising. In between that are carrots. And deer love to nibble on and dig out carrots. So by having trellises on either side, we can then have tape on the ends where they're not going to want to go through and they don't bother our carrots because we've essentially used another crop and a, a trellising need to help exclude them. So there's a lot of different techniques and usually we, we use the uh, exclusion approach for most of these critters. But then you use, and we also used a different approach and I'm gonna leave that to Jill to explain. Uh, so we have always we've had uh, dogs on the farm. We recently added cats on the farm. Um, well, we recognize that that cats can really cause a problem for the songbird population. Uh, our songbirds here have a lot of places to go. Um, we don't feed them. Uh, so the dog and cats have made an enormous difference for us, both in help um, keeping the deer pressed back, that in combination with our fence. Um, but we had a terrible, terrible situation because of our diverse ecosystem um, with ground burrowing mammals. So voles, ground squirrels, mice, all of them. Um, they were a problem in our fields. We were losing huge amounts of, of root crops. We couldn't raise a beet to save our lives on our farm. Um, so the cats have been a huge, cats and dog have been a huge, huge help for us. Um, and we enjoy the company as well. Uh, they can also be adversaries, as you can see the cute paw sticking through the uh, row fabric or the ground fabric. Um, that pepper that was originally in that cell obviously didn't make it, um, but the gains that we've made in in reclaiming ground from these pests were a good trade-off for the occasional pepper plant that disappears because of a furry friend. Yeah, we've had cats on our farm too for as long as we've been here, and it's it's been for the rodent populations in particular. We've We've wanted them around. And if you add having poultry and you have the the feed for the poultry, that's another attractant for rodents. And so you need to do something to handle that. Uh, so at this point, I, we've got a couple neat pictures here that you can look at. I think we'll open it up for questions. Okay, so uh, we I do see one uh, in the chat and I'll read it out loud for those who can't see the chat. Do you frost seed clover early? Like frosty, I'm gonna say this wrong, burr seam? when the temps are warmer than usual? Um, we, we do frost seed clover every year. Um, I generally use a lot of uh, white Dutch, red, um, we're also using a, a fair amount of crimson clover this year as an annual. Um, and it, it's hard to answer that question this year with our, our moving target of weather. Um, we certainly prefer to frost seed clover, but we have, especially the annual clovers, we have put them in as late as May and, and gotten a pretty good result with them. Uh, the perennial clovers, I think you would struggle with them that late, um, but there are so many clovers out there right now, and my, my experience with the diversity of them is pretty limited. Yeah, as far as Brasim clover is concerned, we've done pretty well with on our farm. Now, remember, we're in northeast Iowa. We're a little bit colder zone, uh, but we've been able to do various perseems and seeded them successfully in April. And that has worked pretty well for us. And we often will put perseem in with annual ryegrass. Uh, and that combination works pretty well on our farm. That doesn't mean it'll work well for everybody, uh, but that's one that does work for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, before I read the next one, this is just a reminder that if you do have a question, you can type it into the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen, and I will make sure uh, that Rob and Joe get it. Um, where do you buy your 3D fencing and netting? Um, we use Premier uh, in Eastern Iowa for, for all of our electrical fence um, systems, but anymore, you know, a lot of the farm and home stores will carry the parts of those. So when we were first designing our system, we used Premier. 
um, for that. But now when we just need bits and parts here and there, a lot of times we can get them locally. But but Premier was our go-to. Yeah. And for the netting, same thing. Mm -hmm. Premier One has been our go-to. To, and they they have great service on top of it all. They're willing to answer questions. You usually can get help from them. And they're usually pretty good about working with you. But this, we're finding the same thing with the netting now, Jill. We're able to find things that we can, if we need to do a patch, mm -hmm. uh, if you kind of get comfortable with the material, I think you can find all kinds of ways to fix little little problems that you might have with it. And you can find replacement clips without having to, to go to Premier One to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Premier One's, been, uh, I think we both highly recommend them. All right, thank you. Have you found... Uh, that managing the pollinator habitat is more work as in weeding or mowing when it is in larger plots outside of the garden or if, when it is within the bed area itself? Hmm. Uh, are that are in larger areas that are surround that are in our natural wild spaces, we do other than when we're establishing, you know, we mow. Um, some of them get burned depending on which spaces we're in. Um, but we do very little handwork in those. Um, those that are in our cultivated space, we do tend to spend a little bit more time in. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And, but then again, this is, shouldn't be a surprise. A perennial, a perennial system, maybe we should break this by perennial and annual. Mm -hmm. If it's a perennial planting, then you probably shouldn't, once it's established, have to do too much extra work with it. And if it's an annual system, you are going to have to do extra work with it, if only to seed it every year and get them established. Uh, we actually treat some of those flowers that we interplant as crops. Mm -hmm. So they get a drip tape line. They get cultivated. You know, they're treated just like another crop. But we believe that investment is worth the return by a good deal. Uh, and then if you wanted to, you can always make cut flower arrangements and sell those too. So if you wanted to turn them to a cash crop, you could do so if you wanted to. And we've done a fair amount of that in the last five years. Um, so we're we're doing a, a wide diversity of plantings in addition to our wild spaces that include um, some cut flower work. And we just make sure that those are planted within our vegetable systems as part of our diversity plan, but also to move those pollinator targets around. Um, and we do a combination of heirloom and, and hybrid varieties so that we've got a nice array of um, pollens and nectars and colors and shapes available for our, our wide population because they all they all have different needs. And hey, I noticed Matt Matt Jones asked that question. So any of you, mm -hmm. if we answer a question and you don't think we did well enough with the answer, you can certainly follow up. All right. Um, how do you deal with pocket gophers on fruit tree roots and annual root crops? <laughs> I've not had an issue with them in our fruit tree roots. That's interesting. Um, but I, was, they're an ongoing issue in our high tunnels mostly. Um, and uh, we've tried different trapping things. Some some have been moderately successful. Honestly, the dog and cats have been our our best way of dealing with them. I'd agree with that. We haven't had any specific traffic system that is reliable to take care of the whole problem. Mm -mm. Um, so yeah, pretty much having the critters, having the four-legged friends, that's been our best solution so far. All right. I don't see any other questions in the chat. We have uh, time for one or two more. So if you do have a question, you can pop it down there. Oh, here we go. Uh, do you have a recommendation on dog breed? One that you like. Um, <laughs> our our farm has we've traditionally had uh, blue healer and blue healer crosses, but that's it was just a a personal choice. Um, we we did a fair amount of research as to personalities of breeds and and that matched our needs. Um, but really, it's what what you have access to and what what your other goals are for that animal. I noticed there's a question by Kathy that popped up fairly early that we might have skipped over. Kathy oh. was asking if there's uh, thoughts on heirloom plants that are stated to have more pollen mm -hmm. versus hybrids. Um, and I'll, I'll start with that real quick, and then, Jill, you can follow up. But 
we need to remember that whether they're heirloom or hybrid hybrids, they're uh, they're all selected by humans, not necessarily by the pollinators. Pollinators have different criteria for selecting plants than we do. Uh, so do I think that some of the heirlooms are better personally? I think the answer is yes, in many cases, because when you get into the hybrids, you're often really accentuating certain characteristics that are very, very pleasing to us. Uh, and for a lot of heirlooms to have succeeded, they have to have had some appealing nature for the pollinators. Uh, so that would probably be my logic for it. Now, as far as evidence is concerned, I don't have any specific evidence other than I have a stated bias for heirlooms myself. And so I'd have to do some study before I could say anything more than that. What do you think, Jill? Yeah, I think I think um, we feel very much the same. Um, the the single crop that I can I can think of that I think would be the most obvious is in the sunflower family where they're really developing those pollenless um, cultivars and uh, you know customers really love the pollenless cultivars um, and we do grow one pollenless but everything else we grow is traditional and uh, in our in our sunflower areas anyway. Um, and we see a difference. We see a difference in the insect populations, which ones they prefer and which ones um, we see less, less uh, insect population on. Um, I, I don't have the science background to really say that's just observationally, um, but I can tell you that there are very few plants on our farm that bloom that we don't see any insects on. So we have great wild spaces with lots of blooming native plants. And I, I think the combination is a great thing. Yeah, I do have a question about parthenocarpic varieties, the ones that don't need a pollinator. I sometimes wonder, because we have now selected for something that doesn't need the pollinator, is it possible that those are actually even more of a detriment to pollinator populations? I don't have the answer to that, but again, it's a question. Yeah, that's a good point. And same, I don't have the answer. All right. Um, with that, it is uh, pretty close to one. Um, and let's just see a last minute question. Um, I'd like to thank both uh, Rob and Jill for joining us again here at PFI. And thank you all for logging on and joining us today. And keep your eyes open for any uh, future upcoming webinars. So thank you. I'm going to ask Rob and Jill to stay online really quick. But uh, the rest of you are free to go. And thank you. <laughs>